Hi, I'm Michelle Olivier, and you're listening to Hey, I Want Your Job, the podcast that looks at amazing jobs and what it takes to get them. Hi, and welcome to Hey, I Want Your Job. And today, maybe more than most other days, I actually really mean that because today we are talking to the incredibly talented, incredibly created, creative Tim Doyle. And he, I wish I had the ability to have your job. I straight up do not, like even my stick figures are not convincing as stick figures. Um, but I am super excited to hear from you, what you do, how you do and how you got there. So thanks for being on the show. Um, and let's get started with Tim. What is your actual job title? Uh, thank you, Michelle. Um, so my job currently and has been for 12 years as of tomorrow uh, has been the owner operator of Nakatomi Incorporated. And uh, it's a pop culture, nerd, art, screen print business that I started uh, with my wife at my old house in our garage. And we are now a full-fledged print shop with clients and customers all over the world. And um, we started it to sell my artwork and art by friends of mine who are also artists. And yeah, it's been a it's been kind of a rocket sled ride for a while now and it uh, doesn't seem to be slowing down. So so before we talk art and business, I, I do have to get you to weigh in on the classic issue. Company is called Nakatomi. I have to ask is it a is it a Christmas movie or is it just a good movie? It's it's a movie that takes place at Christmas. Oh. I saw a really good discussion that it has more in common with Hanukkah, in that it is a insurgent force against uh, overwhelming odds, making limited resources stretch way too long wow. for I... a miraculous results. And yet, ho ho ho! Now I have a machine gun. I, I mean, <laughs> I feel like you can't really. It is one of my favorite Christmas movies, but every year my husband and I have this argument because I staunchly am in the, it is a Christmas movie and subject to all of the rules that apply to Christmas movies. I can see uh, that. Yeah. Uh, end of things. Okay, so having agreed to disagree on that one, uh, talk to me, what does, what do you do? Like on a day in and why, what does your job look like? Are you just sitting around being a mad artist in the background with minions, <laughs> turning that into actual physical, tangible things? Are you schmoozing clients? What, what is it you do? It, it's all of that. And it, it can be kind of exhausting after a while. But um, yeah, so I have a staff uh, of four people working for me. Um, you know, I have a bookkeeper, accountant, who makes sure everybody gets paid. I have a shop manager, uh, this guy named Tyler Skaggs, who's been working me, for me for a while now. And uh, he, you know, is pretty much a traffic cop at the print shop, making sure things come in and out, as predicted, you know. Does he have a vest? Uh, he does not vest? have a vest, but maybe we need to get on that. I feel like <laughs> right. there needs to be more costuming involved. Right. <laughs> and then, uh, you know, there's... Uh, Alex, who's probably my longest term employee at this point, and he's been doing the uh, shipping and customer service, and he's taking over some of the social media. And right now, we only have one printer, uh, Aaron, and he uh, he does all the screen printing for our shop right now. And so how do you get? Oh, I'm sorry. Usually, we like to run with two two printers, but uh, because right before COVID hit, uh, my printer Sydney she uh, left to move back to Connecticut. And so we were down a printer and then the world fell apart. So luckily I didn't have to let anybody go or uh, cut payroll or hours. So it was a, uh, it was kind of a fortuitous coincidence there. So how do you get customers? Do people just like, are you a name or you I mean, are you like share in, in your world and people come to you and say, Tim, please make beautiful things for us. Yeah. Well, so it's kind of a three prong thing I do. Okay. So there's, you know, we make artwork that, you know, either I draw or other people draw that I like. And Which collab. is awesome, by the way. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and, um, you know, we release that on our website and we have our own mailing list and social media. And so we sell a lot direct to customer. And uh, 
I also do a lot of commission work for bands who come to us, uh, usually through, you know, a tour manager or a merchandise manager. And they say, hey, we have, yeah, so for the last several years, we've done Metallica's VIP tour poster series. And, you know, they had a contract with this company that provides merchandise and uh, handles VIP ticket sales. Mm -hmm. So I already had a relationship with them for doing some posters for them years ago. They came to me and they're like, hey, we just got Metallica as a client. Would you guys be able to do this? You know, and you're like, oh, twist my arm, it hurts. Oh, yeah. not Metallica. Oh. I, I uh, was never a Metallica fan until the check stuff. Oh. Not a <laughs> fan. Um, but yeah, no, it's- We had uh, very different youths than Tim because I was a huge Metallica fan. So oh, there you go. I was more like a Pixies, they would be Giants guy. I was, I was like, a fan of those as well, but yeah. yeah. Definitely. I had my, my deep goth phase, you know, all black oh, with like, yeah, I feel like you can't be a goth chick in the nineties and not like inner Sandman. Like that was pretty much a requirement. So I, uh, I graduated in 95 from high school and uh, I fell in with the goth crowd at lunch because they were the ones, uh, sitting there playing we were that. the cool kids. Totally. Yeah. Class of 96, by the way. So yeah. No, yeah. There you go. Um, yeah, they were the ones uh, reading comic books and playing magic cards during lunch. So yeah. I was like, this is my people. <laughs> <laughs> I was also wearing superhero shirts, so I didn't fit in perfectly. But um, yeah, so they'll come to us and said, you know, like, hey, you know, we have 40 dates, 40 cities, we need 40 different posters. Uh, initially, they came to me just to do one as an illustrator. I was like, you know, I can art direct this whole series for you. I know all these artists. I own a print shop. We can do it all in house. All you have to do is give me addresses to ship these things to. And um, you know, we've done that for bands like Failure uh, last year, uh, 2019, we did Weird Al's tour poster series, same Very way. Cool. That was cool. That was like a lifelong dream. I got, I got to meet Weird Al. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He's, he was very tired. It was after the show. He was very oh. kind, but he was also very tired. And I realized, oh yeah, this guy's like in his 60s and he plays every night for like five weeks in a row. Of course he's tired. Yeah. I'm 44. I could barely stay awake. Um, <laughs> But yeah, so uh, yeah, it, it's great because I get to hire artists I like and, you know, get to headhunt artists and, you know, just if you call up somebody, an artist you like and just say, hey, do you want to do something for Metallica? They'll say yes. yes. And, you know, everybody gets paid and has a good time. You know? So what, I mean, you live in Austin, which yes. I feel like everybody in Austin is either an artist or a musician or both. Um. It's it like, yeah. like, it's like how in LA, everybody is a model or an actor or both. Mm -hmm. um, so what makes an artist stand out to you in this giant sea of, of talent at all levels and, and angles? Hmm. Um, you know, it's a lot of my friends uh, send me links. They're like, hey, check this person out. Check that person out. I'll get a lot of cold call like resumes and portfolios emailed to me. Okay. Uh, I rarely hire out of that though. Uh, usually it's people I go after. Okay. Um, you know, people have, you know, podcasts is I want your job. So if, if you want to get a job from me, um, yeah, it's, it's usually like have a cool presence online, have a impressive portfolio and you don't have to have done professional work before. You know, I've hired plenty of people like this is my first rock poster. I'm like, well, you're starting at the top because this is a Metallica poster. But, you know, I like what you do. So let's go. Um, so do they need to have a strong social following, like a so strong social media following? Or do they just need to that is understand that space and be talented? Yeah. I mean, the talent, the talent always comes first. Um, and, you know, it's just what appeals to my eye. You know, something mm -hmm. might be really well done, but if, I don't like it. I'm not gonna give my call. <laughs> you know, that's really I, well done, and it's not a style I enjoy. So, you know, I completely understand. My husband and I are uh, pretty diametrically opposed on the art spectrum in terms of our oh, personal wow. preferences. He is a really big fan. Um, he loves your work. He would really love it if I would let him wallpaper his cinema room. I think in in your work, I, that's a hard no. Man Not because third. I don't like it, but like it, it's, it would be a lot. But sure. um, other than that, he really likes like 
a red square on a canvas and you know what I mean with like a white line and I'm like oh my god that's not a thing like <laughs> I like art that looks like a thing um, sure. so, <laughs> yeah like I but I don't understand what you mean like I can see the talent that went into the red square I just personally it's not my jam so yeah. I um so it needs to be something that speaks to you which then in turn speaks to the Nakatomi brand um, right. because you are the Nakatomi the brand like if, if I'm hiring for a client that has to work for that client yeah, yeah, yeah like we'll we'll try to hire you know new and different voices but you know if they can't draw something badass that is going to fit in Metallica's brand well maybe they'll fit with Weird Al's brand where sure. it's more light and comical so yeah, yeah you know it's fun when you can find an artist that can bridge both those you know could do something goofy and do something metal at the same time so so do you just naturally come across these people like just by being you in your life with the friends that you have or do you ever like be like okay i need talent i'm gonna go forth and and seek and find people um if the client so we're, we're talking about art directing a tour poster series like if the client mm -hmm. comes to us with enough lead in time then i can absolutely spend that time to search out new talent so um, where do you go to search Oh, Instagram. I used to go to Tumblr a lot, but Tumblr's dead. Um, you know, Twitter. And... We'll let them know. <laughs> well, no, I mean, they took, they killed the platform by making it all ages. Uh, so anybody who made anything slightly risque suddenly had to, you know, they lost their platform. So, um, and then, then the audience just dried up. So apparently if you start a, a, a platform that allows pornography and then take the pornography away, are your users get upset? And just abandon it. Gotcha. So, yeah, Twitter, Twitter killed itself by trying to be all ages. Um, yeah, but no, Instagram's great. Uh, yeah, and I'll I'll ask friends like uh, one of my good friends in the in this art scene, uh, Tracy Ching. Uh, I asked her, I was like, "Hey, man, like my roster is looking pretty white and male. Who do you know?" <laughs> and she she helped me find a lot of uh, really amazing artists that I, I still work with quite a bit. So, so I think I. That kind of takes me to another thing I wanted to know about. So we know that corporate America has an issue with the white male situation. Mm -hmm. um, talk to me about diversity and inclusion in the art scene. Like, are do we have the same problem there? Are minority voices not being heard and seen in art? It feels like that's the case. Anecdotally, we hear that from some people. Is that yeah. your experience? And what are we doing to fix it? It, it depends on the scene. Um, you know, like the, my friend Ken Harmon, uh, he runs Spoke Art Gallery as long, oh, along with Hashimoto Contemporary. His, his American name's Ken Harmon. He's uh, half Japanese, he's also Ken Hashimoto. But um, his gallery is incredibly diverse if you look at the uh, talent that comes through there. And, you know, but he's also, searching for it so like mm -hmm. the art gallery scene to me where i'm sitting as a you know observer seems to be pretty diverse uh but when you look at the rock poster scene of the late 90s that kind of started here in austin uh it was almost exclusively white dudes and so when i started running mondo for the alamo draft house the talent pool of people who could make screen print posters uh was mostly white dudes and so that's who we were hiring to do the posters. And as time went on more and more, and the scene got bigger and larger and more diverse, um, you know, I, I kind of took it upon myself at, you know, my wife made a point of pointing it out to me. Uh, and she's like, hey, we, uh, we have a lot of dudes here. I was like, you know what? That's a very good point. And, you know, uh, shortly thereafter, I'd had a, I was at New York City Comic Con with some friends and we were having dinner at this Korean barbecue. And this artist, Jen Bartel, who I just think is a fantastic artist. Um, I was like, hey, Jen, you know, if you ever want to do screen printed posters or rock posters, like I would love to get you on board for something. And she said, yeah, I thought about doing that, but it seems like a, a really uh, male, male space. And I was like, yeah, but, you know, and then, and then I think but it was it's my me. Don't you want to work with me? <laughs> I'm yeah. not that guy. But my, my friend, uh, uh, Betty, turned to me and she's like, yeah, gosh, Tim, if only you knew somebody who could do something about that. I was like, oh, yeah. Yeah, right. That's, that's me. Look, I, I do hiring. 
And I was like, okay, next time I get a client where I can really, you know, bring on a new roster of people, I'm going to try to make it more diverse. And, you know, that first year of Metallica, I think out of like 30 posters, yeah, maybe eight or nine were women. And then with the most recent tour we did, I, I did a 50, 50 split. I made sure it was like, I'm going to go more diverse. Um, yeah. And it's just, it, you, you have to, if you're in a position like me, where you're able to do that and you have clients that are, uh, not picky in that regard, you know, like they're not trying to pre-vet all your artists, then you can, it's up to you to make those changes. Absolutely. Like. Absolutely. So one of the things I like about you and your brand is that you say what you think about that, including mm -hmm. politically, including when that at a really volatile time yeah. in uh, American politics and American history. And don't get me wrong, ONH is right there with you. Like, if our saying Black Lives Matter means that we lose your business, that's okay. We yeah. didn't need it that bad. What is, talk to me about how that has played out for you. Have you had pushback? Have you found that people embrace that and that you are getting business because of it? Like, what is your experience with, with being that guy in the business yeah. world? It's hard to say, I mean, I've absolutely gotten benefit from that, but I also don't know the clients that aren't calling me because of it. Sure. You know, like I, I can look at the dollars in sales and they seem to grow every year, you know, some years more than others, but- That's a good problem to have. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but I don't know who's not picking up the phone because sure. I said Black Lives Matter. Yeah. Or you know, trans rights or human rights, that kind of thing. Like, I just, I don't know. JK who. Rowling is never going to be your client. I mean, you're missing yeah. out, my friend. <laughs> what happened to her? What? what? The hell? How did she, why did she have to kill Harry Potter for us? That, that just seems rude. I, cool. every part of me rebels. <laughs> rude. I think it's, I was talking to somebody else about this yesterday. Uh, uh, you know, she, she got so much pushback on it instead of like sitting and listening. She doubled she, down. She doubled down. She felt like she had to entrench. She got defensive Yeah. and entrenched. And once you trench in and have to start kind of like backwards engineering why your bigotry is okay, then you're never going to find the way out, man. Yeah. You know? And it's like, ah, crap. So part of me wonders like if people hadn't pushed back on her, if she might've eventually come out and seen the light, but I say come out of her yeah. hole she dug in, come out of the closet, uh, come out of the hole she dug herself in. But at the same time, like with somebody with that level platform, they got to push back. got to push back. And that's why I'm like, I, I don't think kids should be, <laughs> if you're under the age of 18, you should be able to hit a reset button uh, on your uh, social media or just erases everything. Because, you know, I, when I was 16, I had definite wrong ideas in my head. I mean, if you stopped at 16, you are so far ahead of me and like all the curves, because honestly, I had asshole ideas yesterday. Like, I feel like well, I didn't I'm stop at 16. constantly I'm, learning. Yeah, no, it is it's a constant. We're all work in progress. But yeah, it's just like, so, I mean, that kind of ties into with Nakatomi too. And that, you know, the social media, I feel like you have to be a responsible member of the business community. And even though Nakatomi is a small business, you know, we do have a platform and I feel like we need to use it. You know, and I'm, I'm a very, very left person. Like my personal social media feed is not my business social media feed, but you know, I feel like I can have my company issue a Black Lives Matter statement or do a fundraiser for, you know, uh, do a fundraiser for Black Girls Code and First Robotics which are, uh, you know, STEM stuff for, you know, diverse, a diverse base of kids. And we teamed up with some of the alt government accounts on Twitter to do a big fundraiser. We ended up sending like, I think it was six or seven kids to space camp because of the, oh. the money we raised. It was all, it was all pushed back in 2016 when um, Trump got elected and all the science denialism started coming in. We were like, how can we push back on this shit? Remember back in 2016 so, like, when we thought that was as bad as it was gonna get, Sam, remember that? Yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. Back in the day. <laughs> but so, I mean, and even if you go back to before Trump was elected, we were always pretty socially 
active uh, as a company and uh, it's just more so in recent years. And I, you know, it's, it's my business and I have a responsibility to my employees to make sure that they have a place to work. So, you know, I can't go totally burn it all down. Capitalism is the devil on my social media, you know, but at the same time, I, I do feel like I, I owe it to the world at large to be more uh, socially progressive than other companies. One of my, uh, my business partners is definitely a burn it all down, eat the rich type. And we keep trying to explain that this is why she doesn't ever get to do business development. <laughs> Lydia, we have to make money because our children want to eat. <laughs> that's, yeah. that's where we're at, my friend. Um, but yeah, so I, I, I get that. Um, where do you think all of that sits? We hear a lot right now about cancel culture mm -hmm. and complaining that as soon as somebody says something out of step with reality <laughs> or with public right. sentiment that we're shutting them down people you know are, are boycotting businesses etc what what's your thought on cancel culture and and how all that plays into this well it's tricky because you know if somebody is a consistent problem you know someone like ben shapiro or charlie kirk or you know uh, if somebody's a real problem is actively hurting people then yeah cancel them away but if it's some dumb kid who makes a stupid joke once somebody who doesn't have power you know or it, there was that there's that classic story of that woman who you know got on an airplane and made a joke about and the joke was essentially about white privilege but if you didn't know her you think she was basking in white privilege she said i'm going to africa I hope I don't get AIDS. Oh, LOL, I'm white, it won't happen. And like, if you look at the, and by the time her plane landed, she was the like the top news. Yeah. Yeah, she's like, we must get this bitch. And it's like, like, okay, that's a clunky joke. But the joke was about how horrible the disparity in outcome for, you know, there's, it was, yeah. it was, and if you look at the rest of what she has said over the years, you get some context. And that person didn't have any real power. And it was just like- I remember who that was. I remember the incident. Yeah. But I don't just, remember who it was, but yes. Yeah. Like I totally. Yeah. But like the people really get off on that dopamine rage hit yeah. of saying, I'm better than you. And we all fall for it. I do it too. But, you know, I've, I've been checking myself more and more. And it's just like, you know, well, who's this person really hurting? What do they really mean? Is this really worth- destroying somebody over as opposed to someone like jk rowling who has a ton of power and it can cause a lot of damage and if anything people complaining about that one woman who made that clunker of a reference um it just spread that message further does that yeah. make sense absolutely so, absolutely most of the people so, complaining about the culture need to be canceled but <laughs> we also can't we can't deny the the schadenfreude in us all who want to see people crash and burn. Mine is just a rage. I think that right now, like we all have so much anxiety and so much stress about the crazy that is all around us that we can't impact and we can't do anything about that yeah. when somebody rears their head and gives us a target that we all just want to pounce because it's like, ah, it's a thing I can do. I can rail against this person or this institution. And it's so tempting. Oh my yeah. God. So tempting. And like, I find myself doing it. And my, of course my whole echo chamber, right. On Facebook and social media is all doing it at the same time. And it's really right. easy to, to rally around. And like I said, I, that's that whole, like, asshole ideas I still have on the daily <laughs> that I find that I have to check. I've seen enough people on the left fall for that as well to where I, I realize like that kind of narrow because the people on the right really do fall for that shit and get off on the rage a lot and we have to be better than that. We have to guard ourselves. Like, I mean like simple things like or it's not simple but like vaccine denialism is yeah such a pernicious, dangerous thing. And as many people on the left fall for it as on the right. And like, we can't pretend like we're the party and we're not the right side if we're doing this too. Yeah. You know? Like yep. everybody seems to slow down, 
think about what you're actually doing before you go off on somebody. Yeah. At the same time, some people are fucking Nazis and we need to be called Nazis. <laughs> like, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> we don't. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, you're good. <laughs> but yes, you're right. Uh, if you're a Nazi, you deserve to get called out as being a Nazi. And absolutely, I think that as society, we should say that if that's who you choose to be and how you choose to believe and live your life, then you don't get to play with the other children because you're yeah. a fucking Nazi. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, I'm with you on that one. Um, We're probably far, far field of the uh, the mission of this podcast, but you're good. The mission of this podcast <laughs> is to talk to people like you in in positions of authority, and I think that it's oh, good for people to hear that you know you have opinions, you have beliefs, and that that walks with you when you go into business, that if somebody come, like they can be an amazing artist with a huge social following. And if they show up to their Zoom call with you wearing a MAGA hat, you're gonna be like, no thanks friend, I'm good. Oh yeah, so, I, mean, I, I absolutely will vet somebody's social media profile um, before I hire them, I'll make sure. Yeah, I'm like, if they're, if they're a Trump voter, they're not working for me. There you go. And like, I just can't, because it's a risk. Yeah. If you're out there standing with these people, like we're, we're recording this the day after he gets impeached again, yeah. a week after the attempted overthrow of our government. And if you're standing with that guy, I can't handle that social blowback. Not not only my company wouldn't be able to handle it, but me personally, I'm offended by it. So, I, so I'm not going to get the job. Let's zig a little bit more into the original intent of the podcast. Talk about, I have a question about you personally in that mm -hmm. regard. So- okay. You're a dad, yes. got two kids. Mm -hmm. Let's say they come to you, you graduate, and they're like, dad, I want to be an artist. Sure. Are you going to be like, that's great. That is a realistic job goal. Or are you going to say, hey, friend, maybe that's a plan B? Like, what? what is your thought on that? And what makes it realistic or not realistic? So uh, I'm lucky in that my dad was a working musician or, you know, my whole childhood growing up. Uh, I mean, he did have a day job. He worked at Texas Instruments. We moved to Dallas in uh, 1979. So you could work for TI. Uh, but he was, you know, he met my mom as a musician and, uh, you know, he continued to play gigs. He ended up playing a lot of church gigs in Dallas because of course, Dallas. Um, but, uh, you know, and so he had a path. It's just his expenses outgrew he had a child and then he had another child and <laughs> the expenses outgrew what you can make as a musician so but that kind of like ability to hustle and realize your dreams are there but you have to be realistic about it um i think helped me a lot and my, my parents never dissuaded me but they were at, they would ask questions like okay well how are you going to make a living at that which is a real question that you should ask yourself if you want to get into the arts but they were never like you shouldn't do that yeah, I, and I think, you know, my kids are still super little, so they still want to be mermaids when they grow up. Um, that is so, it. <laughs> is it? <laughs> I, I try not to tell them that there's anything that they can't be, but, like, it does change. Uh, yesterday, it was Iron Man, you know, mm -hmm. today, it's mermaid, whatever. Um, but I do as a mom, like, I, I'm just so practically minded just as a human. And, right. like, with the business background that I know I'm going to be like, okay, <laughs> so let's talk about like, I'm going to need, I know you're nine, but I'm going to need to see a business plan <laughs> on this one. And like, like, I know I just, I know I need to chill out, but it helps me, you know, to, to see people. We have a lot of people in our life who are artists and musicians and those people who actually do that. That is their day job. Right. Um, all of them have some moment in their life where something happened that that's became viable. What mm. do you think was the moment for Nakatomi where all of a sudden it, it was that inflection point where it went from being a maybe good idea in your garage to all of a sudden we have like a big business and we're doing Metallica and have step stuff and all that. Well, it, it's, it's easy to point at like one release where a lot of people paid attention and the print sold out immediately. Um, 
but it was the that that's not one release that does well is not a viable business um you know i had a lot of experience in small business like I, I used to run a small chain of comic book stores here in austin i did that for three years and you know before that i worked at a a baseball card and comic book store up in plano texas and uh you know i knew the owner and you know saw how he hustled and worked the angles every day and you know and after i ran that small chain of comic book stores here in austin i left them and uh at the end of 2004 I started running Mondo for the Alamo Draft House, I think summer of 2005. And I, I built that business to what it was when I left in 2009. So when, when I took it over, it was just like a heat press and some t-shirts to do iron-ons with. And when I left, like, yeah, it was, it went from making like $40,000 its first year to making half a million dollars by the time I was leaving uh, annual sales. Not bad. And I was like, you know. yeah, like, okay well we can do this like this is a, a viable thing so um you know i was like okay i know how to do this i built this for somebody else i'm going to build it for myself and so you know i had a you know long talk with my wife and was like all right you know we didn't have kids at the time if i knew i was going to have kids i might not have been brave enough to make that jump you know because just like i learned with my dad it's about managing your expenses and your sure. debt you know i didn't have any student loan debt I didn't have any, I didn't go to an arts college. You know, I went to community college for a couple of years, got an associate of the arts degree and said, that's enough of that, <laughs> you know? Um, so, you know, we launched the company in uh, January 15th, 2009. And, um, you know, it did okay for a few weeks. And I was like, oh, did I screw up? <laughs> a few weeks. I love it. Yeah. In and you're like, ah, maybe not. Oh my God. Well, I, you know, I, I left, <laughs> when I left the Alamo, uh, you know, I left behind a, it was only like 35K a year at the time, but you know, there was health insurance and security and, you know, I could pay my mortgage, sure. all that. But um, you had a W2 that you could use to like get, you know, mortgages or whatever. Yeah, absolutely. Right, right. Um, yeah, I had, I had bought my house in 2006, right before the market crashed. They, they gave me a loan they absolutely should not have given me but they were giving loans to everybody back then um but yeah uh, luckily i mean obviously it worked out but um yeah and i, I released this print that I, I thought was just too silly i thought it was just really a goofy idea it was a, a spin on that shepherd fairy obama poster for hope but i, I did a i drew optimus prime it says change into a truck instead of hope and change was change into a truck such a corny dad joke before I even had kids. And I was like, this is so dumb, but it's a drawing I have. And like, I know what it costs to get these printed. You know, we only have to sell so many for it to be profitable. We'll put it out there. And then boom, off to the races. It went crazy viral. It went everywhere. I was getting phone calls for people who wanted to license it. Um, yeah, it just did. It... All the right problems to have all yeah. at once. It sold out, so we went back to press for second edition, which is kind of unprecedented at the time. Because a lot of people, the collectible poster market is, you know, it's like baseball cards. People buy something wanting it to be valuable later. So if there's a reprint, they're like, oh, no, you've devalued my initial purchase. And I'm like, well, I got a line of customers who want something, and I'm turning away money. Like, yeah. you're, Sorry. You're, <laughs> yeah. The value of my poster on the secondary market does not put food on my table. So I'm going to print it again. <laughs> I'll print it 50 times if I'm yeah. just going to feed my kids. I mean, we've At this point, we sold thousands of copies of that poster. Like it, it's, it's ridiculous. Um, yeah. So, uh, you know, I, I thought the business was going to go one direction with publishing other artists work mostly. And it ended up being, I'm, I'm the top selling artist on my own website, which, you know, that's worst problems to have. Yeah, it's self-fulfilling prophecy, honestly. It's just like, oh, people want my stuff. I like me. I know the guy who makes I know the guy who makes Tim Doyle artwork. I'm gonna keep doing that. Um, you can call him up right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What do you need done? Yeah, he can do that. Um, but uh yeah, so it, it just you you make all these plans and then you have to throw them all away. That's minute reality hits. But you've at least established a structure to operate in. And, you know, you got all your costs dialed in and just keep going. So, you know, it, it, was, it was a steady drip of experience and 
you know, chance and luck and being prepared for when that chance drops in your lap. So uh, at this point, you've had a couple of things that have gone truly viral. Yeah, I've been pretty lucky. Do you think that there is a formula for creating viral content? Um, my friend Nick Darrington, he's a comic book artist. Uh, this advice might not be, be valid anymore, but he, he said uh, probably 10 years ago or more, he was like, you either do uh, cute things being bad or bad things being cute. Is <laughs> like, you do, oh, a cute cat, but he's like, gonna murder you. Or, yeah, or like, oh, here's a monster, but he's eating Oreos, you know, stuff <laughs> like that. Um, but, you know, that's also been beaten into the ground too. So, you know, I really don't know what the formula is anymore because everybody's doing everything all the time. As the owner of an online business, I can tell you my inbox assures me that there are at least a hundred companies, many of which are based in India, who can absolutely create viral content on my behalf for a low, low monthly subscription fee uh, of one level or another. And I am just exceedingly dubious. Like I, I don't believe that there's a formula for truly a formula for what is going to hook the public's imagination at any given moment. There are some things that are better bets than others um, yeah. that, you know, something evil being cute or something cute being evil is pithy and probably broadly accurate from the whole sure. cat video perspective. But like, I'm not sure that it's, all encompassing. Do you know what I mean? There's also the sure. the chick and the meme screaming at the guy that we've now seen a bajillion times, which is none of those things. Right. So like I I think that there is definitely some sort of a ethereal je ne sais quoi about what is going to work and that, it, that if anybody actually had a formula, they would be insanely rich yeah. <laughs> right now. It's also you know, can you put a new spin on something that's familiar? Like I had that series of prints called Unreal Estate where I, I drew I know. <laughs> I did like Simpsons locations, but in kind of like a dark moody style. Yeah. And it was transformative enough to where you know people were like, oh wow, look at that, you know, and but it also didn't break the mold so much to where it was unrecognizable. Um, but yeah, that was just something I wanted to draw. The Totoro one is my personal favorite, mm -hmm. just for the yeah. That. My, my daughter's name is May because of my neighbor Totoro. Oh my gosh. That is my son, my oldest son. That is currently his favorite movie ever is uh, is Totoro. He walks around so singing uh, the, the Totoro song all the time. <laughs> yeah, I love it. There's a, there's a Totoro back uh, right there. You can barely see it, but yeah. Um, uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, it's a... Uh, I've just been pretty lucky and you know I think my, my skill set is decent enough to where even if I'm not clever it's a pretty drawing and yeah you know, it'll sell. So if in some horrible apocalyptic future which mm -hmm. I do not wish upon you Nakatomi sure. ceases to be Tim mm -hmm. Doyle quits being cool and you don't stay on trend I know sure. I know hard to believe but you know um what would you do instead where would you be what would you do if all of this folds, what's the plan? You know, at this at this point, I don't know if I have a plan. Um, <laughs> For me to not put that into the universe so that it doesn't happen, that's the plan. <laughs> well, there's so many, like, let's say I, I could no longer draw. There's so many artists I work with and properties that I, I, I work with that I could, you know, art direct uh, and produce stuff for for years like there, there's a artist i was working with um this comic book artist bernie wrightson and just you know end up chance meeting when he moved to austin guy's kind of a legend he he co-created swamp thing uh he did creature design for the ghostbusters movie oh and dude that is very that is definitely yeah. legend yeah <laughs> the, Quest and the mist and so so you know and, and we just became friendly and you know, i started publishing his art prints and uh, he, he passed away in 2017, but I, I continue to work with his wife and his estate. And so we released his work. And if I shifted focus to doing just Bernie Wrights and stuff, I could support myself and, you know, pay the licensing fee and all that. Like, that'd be fine. But I, I think I have so many irons in the fire that 
for any, like, let's say the website closed tomorrow. I still have stuff in consignment shops and galleries all over the world to where, you know, I, I, it's, it's passive income. I'm not creating. You're going to eat for a few years just based on, yeah. on what you've done so far. Like just the catalog of artwork we keep in print. And that, that was a lesson I learned in 2009 with the change into a truck print is that keeping it in print gives you a much broader reach than if you keep it limited and collectible. Because I, I was working at a comic store when Beanie Babies hit in the 90s and everybody, yeah, <laughs> I see those eyes rolling. Um, yeah, but like people bought into that hype and bought a bunch of Beanie Babies and a couple this months later- not a lie. My sister mm-hmm. has a collection of Beanie Babies that she got off Buy, Sell, Trade on Facebook that mm. she truly believes is her retirement fund. <laughs> Yeah, no. because they're going to be worth a mint. I'm like, oh, no. No, yeah. they're not, but okay. <laughs> the supply has outstripped demand. But, By, yeah. And, and you know, people, people thought they were going to be collectible and valuable, but they just went away and they're not that anymore. But you know what? Beanie Babies are still made today and they're still selling. Like, yeah. So, and they're still cute. And, yeah. you know, yeah, they are still what they always were, which is a toy for kids. Yeah. So So I've seen enough collectible markets collapse over the years of working in collectible stores that I realized I had to get away from that model and just supplying artwork to people who want it was, became the goal. And, you know, people are like, oh, your artwork's in these like consignment shops. Like it's a bunch of like house moms and stuff buying work. I'm like, yeah, they have money too. Like, (laughs) I don't need it to be collected by a bunch of like guys my age who are. You don't need like, street cred. You just need a credit card that will yeah, take the yeah, charge. That's the credit I need because I'm still doing exactly what I want to do. It's just the audience is broader, and yeah, that's another thing too. I realize like it's something I try to do at Mondo that they shut they shot down, but I've noticed they've since come around on. Is I tried to, I was like, hey, let's you know we're doing a lot of dude movies like Blade Runner and The Thing and stuff. I was like, what? let's do some more, you know, woman-centric movies and stuff. Let's, not everything has to have like explosions and be badass. And they're like, no, 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 we're not doing that. Now, they do that now, 12 years after I left. You were just ahead of your time, Tim. That's your problem. But I was like, there's more women than men in the world and they like <laughs> to buy things too. <laughs> like, we should make stuff for the <laughs> other half of humanity as well. That's a market we're ignoring. So, so yeah, I, with I regard, <laughs> so but, right now you are everywhere. Like you're in galleries, like you said, you're in consignment and you also are in all of like the local big art shows. So like the Armadillo and the Blue Genie, which is where my husband fell in love with your art. Mm-hmm. Um, and every year visits it lovingly like it's you know his little personal art mecca uh, <laughs> uh, I can't believe that he is actually not in here right now just to like be close uh to the creator of his favorite stuff um so what is your thought on those kind of scenes because there's more and more of that happening with like you getting in all kinds of different areas you're getting more and more of this like art collective sales vibe with things in Austin, we've got East, we've got, like I said, Blue Genie, we've got the Armadillo, but that's true in more and more sort of cities and areas across uh, at least the US. What is your thought on those? Are they good business for artists? Are they a good way to break in? Are they something that everybody has to do, but they're terrible business? What's your thought? No, I, I Blue Genie and Armadillo, it, it sucks that there was no Armadillo this year, but it's also completely understandable. Um, Blue Genie reformatted how they do business and I was in and out of there several times restocking this year and it was incredibly safe um, yeah I felt like oh they're, everybody's respecting the rules they're not only letting so many people in you know the aisles are wide um, but uh, they're, they're very important to our business because we do so much locally out of shops like Parts and Labor and A-Town Consignment and even Austin Books and Comics um, who sell our work hmm. that 
I, I, I thought at some point the market would be capped out. Like some, at some point people are going to be tired of buying my work, but Austin, <laughs> Austin is such a growing city and you know, there's always new people coming in and they always need more artwork to decorate. And yeah, like Armadillo and Blue Genie are just another part of that equation where, you know, we, we do tremendously well out of there. Um, you know, my sales this year at Blue Genie were higher than they've ever been. Oh, wow. I Which is that... amazing for a pandemic year is why I'm a wowing that. Um, not like, oh, I can't believe people buy it yourself, but the, I, I, that's for a year where nobody's sales have been record high. Would, that's great. Part of me thinks that because there was no Renegade Craft Fair, because there was no Armadillo, if this was the only place you could go to get that kind of work. That makes sense. Plus, Blue Genie trimmed its vendors by about a third so there'd be more space. So there's less competition for the dollar, for the blue genie dollar, and there's less competition. But, but at the same time, there were fewer people because like we are pretty diehard blue genie and armadillo attenders. And we <laughs> did not attend the blue genie this year from a safety perspective, not from a want of love for the artist there, just oh, sure. from a, you know. And so, I, I definitely felt, I felt odd. Uh, I didn't promote blue genie this year because I couldn't, in good conscience, tell people to go to a place to buy things. Yeah. Um, which, but I also need Blue Genie to exist. Yeah. Because I need that paycheck every January, you know, but for December sales. And it, it's same, I feel the same way about parts and labor on South Congress. Like they're kind of the unsung hub of the Austin maker artist community in that so many artists, they're in such a prime retail space and have such a great customer base that if parts and labor went away, you're suddenly, artists all over the city will have to move out. You know, they're like they're paying their mortgage because this place exists. Yeah. yeah. And you know, it should, it should be getting a grant from the city. You know, it's, just, it's as, as vital as live music, in my opinion, to like the arts community. Um, yeah, but you know, there are some, I've done big comic book conventions all over the country, and those are usually a break-even thing. But Armadillo and Blue Genie are wildly profitable, so. So those smaller local ones are better business in your experience. Yeah, like New York, New York City Comic Con is such a racket. <laughs> um, <laughs> and like, I know, the, I know the people put the show on aren't really making money hand over fist. It's the it's the unions who will charge you $500 to move a box from here to here. You know, you're like, uh, no, dude, I'm not paying that. Like, what are you talking about? Um, so, and everything's just so expensive, but the exposure is great. But I'm like, well, is this really translating into sales on the back end? Like, am I picking up more sales in the long run by being here? So one of the things I've loved about this conversation so far is that like, I feel like there's this really strong balance between creative artistic Tim and like what, you know, I, I want to turn cat buses into lawn art right, <laughs> and, a, right. and a picture and, and like business headed Tim, who's like, mm, is that good business or is it just fun to go to comic con? <laughs> and, right. and like, I think that, I think that that is, a really important message for anybody who wants to work in the arts. I think that people get caught up in how exciting the creativity portion of it is. And they forget that at the end of the day, it's a business and that it's not, you're not any good to an organization. If all you want to do is come in and be creative, that you do also have to listen to customers <laughs> And you do also have to behave professionally when dealing with customers and meet deadlines and, you know, that you can't just, I think there's this impression that some people have that artists never do anything on time and that they just, you know, sit around and think creative thoughts all day, doodle something and then make money. And I think that it's really good and important message that that, that is not how it yeah. works. <laughs> oh, that it did, <laughs> but no, it is not. I mean, I've, I have learned from art directing other artists that sometimes it's like herding cats. And you, you'll always notice uh, when I do a tour poster series, the first four or five dates are always the same four or five artists because those are people that I know can deliver quickly on time and 
do good work. And like, they're always my marquee, like go to like the series is going to launch. You're going to get Tracy Ching. You're going to get Jesse Phillips. You're going to get Josh Budich, um, you know, the, the few others in there, but uh, you know, those guys are always my go-to people, you know, and it's, uh, you have to be able to, they'll always have work with me. As long as I have work, they'll have work with me. Um, but some of the ones on the back end are just like, man, that guy doesn't send me their art. I don't think I could work with them again, you know? And it, it's, I, sometimes I feel me being at least a little bit business brained has given me a lot of advantage over other artists. And I'm not saying I'm real great at it or some guru, like I'm some guru people would come to for advice on how to run an sure. art business. But I also know a production schedule and unit cost. And, you know, it's just, you have to stay, you have to keep both things at the forefront if you want to run an art business, because otherwise you're going to be in debt and out of business real quick. So we're running out of time, but there's one more thing I just have to a little bit call you out on, which okay. is I hear this huge amount of imposter syndrome. Like mm -hmm. Nakatomi is a big deal in the local art community. Like you are not, I am not interviewing some guy that one time made a poster that was a big deal. Like Nakatomi is a huge deal. You do Metallica, you are at all of these places. There are tons of artists out there that would love to be on that list of people that you just rattled off as like, these are the guys that always have work with me. And yet I hear you continually like, I mean, it's not that big of a thing. It's just, it just happened. So do you think, do you see your own, like, do you think of it as imposter syndrome? Do you think that it's just like, you're being humble and good natured? Like, what's your take? I think it's because I, I know how how fragile it is and how lucky like there, there's so much luck involved in this that it, it, I could be you know working I could be back to being a waiter again you know if a couple things didn't bounce the right way um and maybe I am being humble but it's also how I feel like I, I don't I'm not consciously being humble I'm just like well maybe I should toot my own horn but <laughs> I have had great successes and and you know people do know my work and it's always really fun when I meet somebody like I, I was restocking my blue genie booth and somebody's like oh man I really like Tim's artwork he's good he's like yeah, yeah that, that guy like I was like that like that's me I, I drew it and then they, they like freak out they're like oh my god I mean I'm like, you have no idea how, like, it's not that big a deal. Like, I just do this thing. <laughs> people... I just do this thing and people get really excited and pay me money. But, you know, I don't know what the thing is. Like, it's just the thing that I do. <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, but then I, I have friends who are artists who are just, like, all about that life. And they are really, you know, riding high on their own fumes. And, you know, but they've also, I feel like they've earned it too. So I don't know. I, part of it too is, you know, I, I have kids and mm -hmm. nothing will make you more humble than having to have kids it is constant humiliation. Constant. Yeah. And work and thankless work. And, you know, I mean, I, I couldn't be doing most of what I'm doing if, if my wife wasn't my backstop on so much of this, you know, like it's, uh, you know, she's doing the daily school stuff now because the kids can't be in school. And that's, I couldn't be here doing this interview right now. <laughs> you know, uh, when I get off this interview, I'm going to go answer some emails. I'm going to start drawing on something. And I couldn't do that if it wasn't for her. So it's, it's just such a team. It really is. A, it's a mom and pop shop in many ways. Well, I love it. I love the humility, but just, you know, do know that, like I said, you've got a big fanboy downstairs in my house, at least. And I know a bunch of others as well. And I agree with you about the humility thing. My husband says I used to have pride and then I had kids. <laughs> my children are very into having musical numbers on demand. No, so really. yeah, we find that we're often in public places and there is a demand for a family musical number. Oh. You know what is not worth your life is arguing with a four-year-old because of your sense of pride. Like, so oh, there you go. 
Musical number it is, my friend, singing and dancing. Great, I can't tell you how many, my, uh, when my kids were born, they both were bad sleepers. And mm. um, the song that I know that is the longest song that I know all the words to is Hallelujah. And I am oh. a terrible singer. But that was the song that I would sing because there's also just something kind of droney about, you know, Hallelujah, you know, with the three o'clock in the morning thing. And I cannot tell you how many public places that would in a previous life have been totally humiliating to me. I have had to sing Hallelujah at full voice because it was the only way to shut up a fussing baby. So um, yeah, I feel yeah. you. <laughs> I love how that song keeps getting used in like completely inappropriate ways, like in kids movies and stuff. I was like, that's, have you heard the lyrics for that thing? That's not, um, okay. Honestly, come- that irony is part of my favorite thing. <laughs> that being my kid's love- lullaby of choice. <laughs> it's a wonderful, beautiful song about uh, some dirty sex sometimes. So. <laughs> yeah. Apparently there's like 80 verses in total that he wrote and so you can just like, so I made a study of like finding new verses to add into it. So I'm up to like eight or nine verses now that I know. Yeah. So it's very long, which is great. Um, <laughs> but we digress. So um, that is all that I had for you. Is there anything else that you want to make sure to do a shout out about or, or a plug before we go? Yeah, I mean, obviously, the website Nakatomi Inc. Inc. dot com. Yep. Uh, my own personal website for my portfolio, timdoyle.com, which I It'll got be in the show notes. So do not worry. Okay. Um, oh, my one bit of advice for artists is uh, get your name as a URL immediately. Even if you don't think you're going to do anything with it, go buy your name dot com immediately and keep up on the payments on that. Because I waited about 20 years to get TimDoyle.com. Australian Tim Doyle had to disappear off the planet. I think he's dead. And he let it lapse. And that's why I'm now TimDoyle.com. There we go. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> that is sage advice. Um, and, and I appreciate it. Um, thank you again for your time, Tim. Um, and we will have absolutely links to all of your contact details for both you and Nakatomi in the uh, show notes. Um, And uh, thanks again. Um, Bye. You've been listening to, Hey, I want your job. For more information on how you can get your own awesome job, visit ONH Consulting at www.onhconsulting.com. We offer incredible resumes, no-nonsense career advice, and real-world tips for landing a job in today's market. Check us out on LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, and Insta for more insider information. Soon, you'll be hearing us say, I'm Michelle Olivier, and hey, I want your job.